भारत रत्न प्रोफेसर सी एन आर राव डॉक्टर चिदम्बरम प्रोफेसर सी एन आर राव डॉक्टर अरविंद मैत्रा एंड ऑल माय यंग फ्रेंड्स इन द ऑडियंस अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू इट गिव्स मी अ ग्रेट प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस एशियन साइंस कैंप 2016. वी हैव a very distinguished and renowned scientist who are going to speak in next 5 days professor c n r rao uh, cedric villani uh, george bednots takaki kajita ajay sood raghavendra gadkar a very warm welcome to all of you and we thank you for for taking time from your busy schedule to uh, inspire the young mind in this asian camp i would like to invite dr chidambaram to give the inauguration speech dr sena rao national research professor and honorary president jawaharlal nehru center for advanced scientific research fact he has been he is a former director of this uh, institute professor j m modak deputy director in institute of science dr arbind mitra advisor department of science and technology distinguished speakers leaders of the delegations young participants ladies and gentlemen i am very pleased to join dr modak in uh, extending a warm welcome to all the highly talented student delegates who have assembled here today from 23 nations to participate in the 10th edition of the Asian Science Camp and to listen to some of the most eminent scientists of the world. I also extend a warm welcome to the accompanying teachers with the participating teams, the distinguished scientists and peers to the science city of India also known as the IT capital of the world, Bangalore, Bengaluru. on my own behalf and on behalf of the honorable minister of science and technology government of india who was eager to participate in today's function but could not come due to unavoidable circumstances i thank the indian institute of science for hosting this prestigious camp very appropriately kishore vigyanik protsahan yojana is organizing the asian science camp 2016 Dr. Chidambaram, Dr. Modak, Dr. Mitra, many distinguished colleagues from abroad and from India, and my dear students from all over Asia. It's a great pleasure to be here. Why do we need such a camp? Well, it is not just to learn what is in the books, but just to have an opportunity to meet not only people from your own country, from other country, not even that, to hopefully have a chance. where some ignition occurs i can tell you some of the biggest stories of science i heard of great scientists i find that their lives were really ignited by science on one occasion by meeting somebody by listening to somebody one lecture here and there something like that in my own life i can tell you i am now 83 years old when i was very young i was 11 years old when i first listened to professor cv raman in bangalore I will never forget it in my life. He came to our school and gave this lecture with so much spirit. My God, when I saw him, my God, I thought I must be like that. Well, of course, I will never be like that. He was such a great man. But the question is, the bug of science, the, vi- the virus of science, attacked me very severely. And I'm still a scientist. Go on, go on. I'm doing research for the last 65 years now, and I've been I've been a professor for 57 years, and I will not quit. Thanks been wonderful. Finally the ambience of the setting here the fun frolic and joys of this camp would not have been possible without the generous hosts of this event the iconic Indian Institute of Science on behalf of the Department of Science and Technology and all the participants of the 10th Asian Science Camp and the dedicated team at KVPY who have toiled hard and graciously extended the facilities Uh, to make this camp a reality please join me in giving a big hand to the indian institute of science and kvpy
let's have a glimpse of the participants uh, from various countries through a short video. We are from Myanmar. I thought I would not make it a very heavy talk based on lots of signs, either discoveries or new phenomena or new observations and so on. But talk a little bit about the story of science itself. Now this gives me an opportunity because we are now in 2016, which is a very, very important year for chemical science. And as an introduction to that, I would say something about science itself. Don't forget, just a few years ago, we celebrated the 200th anniversary of Charles Darwin. I hope you all remember that. If not, please do try to find out what Darwin did. But what is more, even more interesting is, just a few years ago, we celebrated the centenary of the discovery of the atomic structure by Rutherford. 2011, exactly 100 years earlier, 1911, the structure of the atom was uh, unraveled by Rutherford. Rutherford is a very unusual story. I hope you know that. Everything was accidental. Rutherford was a young student in New Zealand, and he decided to do a PhD in Cambridge. Those days, since I'm still a professor in Cambridge, let me tell you, Cambridge did not allow outsiders to do PhD in that university at all. Only you had to be an undergraduate from Cambridge to get a PhD there. But in the year 1895, for the first time, they said, we'll not have this rule anymore. The first student to be admitted from outside Britain to do a PhD in Cambridge was Rutherford. Accidentally, that year he had finished his bachelor's degree in physics and mathematics and so on in New Zealand, and he went to, went to Cambridge. This is the thing about science. When he went there, what does he see? He works, sees J.J. Thompson just about to discover the electron. If you remember, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron in 1897, and Rutherford was a student at that time. Wonderful atmosphere. He entered Cambridge at exactly the time when people were worried about atoms, structure of atoms. And of course, J.J. Thompson gave a structure of the atom, which was unfortunately wrong, and then Rutherford gave the structure of the atom. He gave it in 1911. But don't forget, Rutherford, when he in 1895, he entered. In 1908, just 13 years after he entered Cambridge, he got the first Nobel Prize. He did, got a professor in chemistry for something else. But this is the Rutherford in the center with Cockcroft and Walton. Then, if you remember, Rutherford's atom, model of the atom, is something that we use. Though it is slightly wrong, at least he corrected J.J. Thompson's model in 1911. By that time, of course, he was already famous, already had a Nobel Prize. Now, chemistry at that time was considered to involve structure, dynamics, and synthesis. These are the three important things in the 1960s, we used to say, chemistry is made of three components, doing structure, doing synthesis, doing dynamics. But unfortunately, and then, of course, what happened in the 70s, about 30 years ago, biology entered chemistry in a big way. Advanced materials entered chemistry in a big way. Today, chemistry is no longer that simple. Chemistry is no longer a simple subject that people think. In India today, in most countries in the world, they think, oh, chemistry, well, that organic chemistry, physical chemistry. Oh, no, no, that is not. Chemistry is the most interdisciplinary subject today. It is a subject which encompasses essentials of biology, Essentials of many aspects of physics, essentials of condensed matter, physics, so all kinds of material science. And today, chemistry of materials is a very, very important thing. For example, I'll give you here, chemists have contributed to high, te high temperature superconductors, synthesis of new carbon forms, fullerene, carbon nanotube, nanomaterials, metaporous solids, a whole bunch of things. All these materials are made or studied by 
chemistry today. So materials, say chemistry became part of material science. Well, what I have tried to say is, to be a scientist is a wonderful thing. And to succeed in science, to be really succeed in science, not be becoming famous, I don't mean, to enjoy science, I think you need some qualities. And I've, of all these qualities, I feel the most important thing is to give everything to the young. And give everything. That is what Humboldt said long ago, and I repeat what Humboldt said, give everything you have to the future generation. And that is what we have to do. Well, I am now stopping, I have to stop. People ask me, you are a mad fellow, you are 83 years old, you are working in science. Well, I keep telling them, you know, there is no age in science. And age is in the mind, actually. How old you are depends on you. Uh, 83, you can feel like 18. So it, uh, it's an amazing thing. Science doesn't worry about the age. Well, the, what is very particularly interesting, there is a very famous musician, a great master in music in India, and he was asked just before he died a few a couple of years ago, what is it you pray to God about? He said, well, oh God, let me be in the world of music as long as I live. As far as I'm concerned, my prayer to God is, oh God, let me be in the world of science as long as I'm alive. Thank you. No reason then that science nowadays gets into the economic-oriented journal. And actually, it was a big marvel when the readers of the Wall Street Journal one day in 2009 discovered the results of a study made by an institute specializing in job market and asserting that best job in the world was mathematician. Mathematics has also been a revolution in culture and, uh, you know, leisure industry. For instance, in the movies. This is a picture from famous movie Gravity, which won a number of awards. And uh, it required years and years of preparation before the movie to, you know, devise the software that would be able to recreate the effects. In the movie, essentially, everything is artificial, except for the faces of the actors, basically. So everything you see in this picture is artificial, has been computed with beautiful software. And uh, for this, you need good mathematics integrated in the software. Let me note that also in this, you see the power of mathematics as a way of creation. Mathematics is something that not only enables us to understand well, but also can recreate a world. And you may, for instance, decide that you want a new world in which the laws of physics are different, like suppress the gravity. For instance, another example is that in the cartoons, in, a, in a, a movies, very often when there is hair, hair rendering of uh, heroines with long hair is all a big thing. In, uh, like in games like Final Fantasy or in uh, movies like Brave and so on. And there are mathematical models to describe the motion of the hair, which is not the real one, but adapted, transformed. This is another example in which you create a new world with different laws. So uh, I have heard you say it's about the instability of the solar system, right? So I'm wondering if the solar system, as we know it, has the age of 4.6 billion years. Mm -hmm. So if it has such an instability from its own creation onto this day, why we have such a seemingly stable solar mm -hmm. system on this day? And, did, uh, and how can you use this principle to predict what, does, uh, what did it look like in the past, mm -hmm. since its creation and its evolution to be this solar system That's as we a see very, it. very good point. Uh, the first, um, 
the specialists nowadays tell you that there is a limit to the amount of time in which you can run the equations. And the limit is 60 million years, about. So if you try to reconstruct the motion of the planets backwards in time, you are stuck at 60 million years ago, which is very short, you know, in the time of the dinosaurs. A bit more, a bit less than the dinosaurs. By the way, they even discovered that the instability was worse than they believed. Uh, the instability, the, uh, there is the main factor of instability in the solar system are not the planets, or not directly the planets, but the two biggest asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. They are named as Ceres and Vesta. They are tiny, tiny. Their mass is like one billionth of the mass of the sun. But they are in such unstable configuration that tiny change in their configuration have a lot of influence. So for instance, if you change the position of Ceres by two centimeters, it has an important effect on the position of the Earth in 60 million years. Can you believe this? So it's like these uh, uh, butterfly effects. And now you ask, why does it look stable in spite of this instability? Uh, th then there is speculation. But people ba like Lascar speculate that it has not been. And that maybe in the past it was in a different state. For instance, many people believe that there was an extra planet billions of years ago. And that this planet was lost by our system. So there was. Some, uh, it did not look really like it is now. Let me start with a quote by Justus Liebig. He was a, uh, a chemist in, in Germany and did a lot of uh, pioneering work. And uh, he came up with a, with, a, with a saying, major breakthroughs in science and technology are frequently achieved by people who regard nothing as impossible. And this leads me to the next line here. That means if you are uh, doing research, if you are curious enough, you will see that there are apparent fundamental limits, maybe in physics or chemistry, or limits in technology. And these limits, if you are alert enough, realizing that there are questions which are still open, will lead to a source of inspiration for research project in exploratory research or in, in technology. Also new concepts come, in, come into play and uh, I'm extremely uh, enthusiastic about uh, this magnetic billet heater because it's really uh, an amazing uh, application. Uh, this uh, application got the German environmental prize uh, from the German president in 2009. And it's applied it's, um, uh, in the metal processing industry. And you have to know that the metal processing industry uh, uses uh, up to 5% of the total electricity use of an industrial country. 5% is a lot. And it's, and it's used for a, 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 a process just to heat metal bars before they are being transformed into profiles and tubes and so on. Heating, the heating process facilitates the deformation uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the metal. So this is a schematic uh, drawing of the uh, billet heater. It's, uh, the, in principle, a, a magnet made from high TC wires uh, producing a DC magnetic field. And here you see the metal bar, a cylinder or whatever. And this metal bar, of course, is a normal metal, is rotated in the DC field. And if you have a rotating or a moving metal in a, in a, in a magnetic field, this is producing an eddy current. So a current is flowing. The current, this eddy current, is heating 
this metal cylinder within a very short time, shorter than any other uh, uh, process, in a very short time, and it's heating much more homogeneous because it's not suffering from surface effects if you have an induction heater or a radiation heater. So much more homogeneous, uh, which and the consequences are that um, the uh, productivity is increased by 25% because the heating process is, is, is faster, the oxidation problem uh, by being faster is less, and uh, the uh, speed of deformation because it's more homogeneous, the, the heating process, uh, the speed of deformation is higher. So that's 25% uh, increase in productivity and 50% reduction in energy consumption. And that's a lot. This help uh, in case intuition uh, and imagination is needed uh, to lead to completely new uh, and revolutionary con concepts. And I think uh, I stop here.